The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webcast, and thank you to Babson Survey Research Group, eLiterate, and WCET. My name is Megan Raymond, and I am the Assistant Director of Programs and Sponsorship here at WCET. If this is your first webcast, we're thrilled to have you. Do note that you can access today's slides by clicking on the handout box toward the lower right-hand side. The webinar is being recorded, and we will make the PowerPoint, any resources that are shared, and a link to the archive available to you within a week. And we tend to have a pretty active Twitter back channel, so if you're interested in following along, the hashtag is WCET Webcast. Today we're going to move quickly through this presentation so we can get to all of your questions and answers. We'll do brief introductions. We'll talk about Digital Learning Compass and the work of the group, get into the report's key findings, and audience question and answers. And Everyone that is registered today will receive priority access to the distance, excuse me, the Digital Learning Compass report, and you'll receive that via email. If you have any questions throughout the webcast, enter them into the question box, and we'll be sure to get those toward the end of the presentation during the Q&A. Today's moderator is my colleague, Terry Taylor Strout. She's a senior research analyst here at WCET. I'd like to go ahead and let Terry take it from here. Great. Thank you so much, Megan. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here with us today. Um, this is very exciting um, for me. Um, we are here to announce um, Digital Learning Compass, which is a very exciting collaboration um, between the organizations um, represented on today's webcast. Um, those of you who have been watching this distance education data um, evolve over time, um, kind of know that the players in this arena really are Russ Poulin um, from WCET, Phil Hill from Illiterate, and Jeff Seaman uh, from the Babson Survey Research Group. And I think it, it, it bears mentioning that um, there's been great collaboration between these three organizations um, even prior to the iPad distance education data being available starting with the 2012 data. Um, and so it just seemed to make good sense to sort of formalize that collaboration a little bit more. Um, I'm going to let Phil and Jeff um, introduce themselves, but I really did want to kind of acknowledge the fact that um, this has been ongoing work and um, you know, it's just been it's been great to have colleagues that have a same the same understanding of the data, and to have some, you know people who we can sort of check our de our ideas against and um, moving you know trying to move forward with a real understanding of what's happening with the statistics in this field and what that means um, for our industry. So let's first turn it to Phil for a quick self introduction. And then we'll move to Jeff, and then we'll dive right into the data, because that's why everybody's here. Thanks, Terry. Uh, yeah, my name is Phil Hill. I'm co-publisher of the eLiterate blog, uh, where it's a blog, but we also do market analysis on ed tech and online education. Also do consulting through MindWires Consulting. And as Terry had referenced, this is quite exciting for us. Um, I've been reading uh, Jeff and Elaine's reports through the Babson Survey Research Group for years. So if you're a data geek, it's great to be able to work with someone who's provided such a valuable service. And the longitudinal study of these surveys really capture what's actually happening with online education. And that's just such an important factor so that schools and vendors and policymakers are trying to make their decisions based off of reality and not misconceptions. So I've been uh, reading the work for years, uh, several years, been working sort of in the back channels with Jeff and Russ and Terry, and we at eLiterate are thrilled to sort of formalize this, um, formalize this uh, conversation and work with them in this new partnership with the Digital Learning Compass. So I'm looking forward to it. Thanks. And this is Jeff Seaman. 
Um, and pleasure to be here, uh, and thank you all for attending. And I also am very excited about the prospects of this kind of collaborative effort that we have going. It's already proven to be extremely valuable. We So what you'll hear today is uh, some previews of the report we have coming out in about two weeks, which is our first under the this new Digital Learning Compass brand, um, but there are many others in the works and for a long-term plan, and so we hope that among the two biggest changes we hope you will see from this kind of approach, one is that there will be more of these kinds of things coming out that are coordinated and we're all working together on this, and two, that we'll be able to go into greater depth in different types of areas than we've been able to do previously. Um, so I, with that, I think probably time to start talking about what we came here for, which is taking a look at some of the data. So first, let me um, give a bit of background. So this is um, at the Bethlehem Survey Research Group. We were doing data collection on online learning starting um, way back when our first uh, report came out in 2004 with data that had been for previous semesters for that and have done that every year since. Um, and then moving to using the iPads distance education data when that was first released in, in the for fall of 2012. What we're, the universe we've actually, we picked the same universe luckily when we started, which was for all of that time, both for the Babson collected data and for the more recent iPEDS data, where the universe we're looking at is all institutions, higher ed institutions that grant a degree of any variety, any type of degree, that are active in that current year and that the public can attend. Um, that's typically the number of areas from year to year. Some schools go out of business, others are formed, there's mergers sometimes and also within iPEDS multiple campus systems sometimes report as a single campus and sometimes it's multiple, so the number changes a bit. It's typically 4,700 and something, so about 4,750 plus or minus a few each of the years. So that's what we're talking about. This data um, is now from the iPads data is the most comprehensive available. It has its issues, but it still is what the best out there. Um, and want to give a special thanks to the organizations that are supporting this. Uh, they're listed here. Pearson is uh, supporting this, and they have been for a number of years. OLC, also a long-term supporter, and the original project was both supported by the Sloan, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, which also supported Sloan C, the previous name for OLC. Titan Partners has been part of this for a number of years, and NC SAR has added this year. And they were actually going to be part supporting um, one of our next publications, a special report that you'll hear about more in the future. Um, so let's start off with taking a look at the big picture background of this. And I want to set the stage by taking a look at what's happening to overall enrollments in higher education. So could I have the next slide, please? Um, and the world is shrinking. So first, a bit of background. During the 12 years that we were doing this at the Baton Survey Research Group, the overall size of the higher education world increased. It grew from 16.6 million to um, about 21 million in that time period. So that's an, that's an average growth rate of 2.5% every year. So during that time when we saw most of the original growth in online and distance education, it was happening in an area where the overall size of the higher education market was also increasing. And one of the key questions was, was it how much of the growth was being driven by this online and how much of the growth was inherent, how much of would we have seen if we had not had an expanding universe, and would institutions have been as successful if the total pool of students hadn't been increasing so much over that period of time. When you were adding another three to four million students over that decade, that was adding a lot more potential students that you could be enrolling in your distance program. 
The world has changed, however. So looking here, this is the total number of students enrolled in for any modality. So whether they're studying on campus or online or anywhere, for each of the past four years for which we have data, and shows that it has been shrinking. And this is a very new environment for institutions to be operating in. So that um, from 2012 to 2013 went down 1.2%, then down 0.8%, then another 1.2%. So in 2015, there's over 3%, 3.2% fewer students available for institutions that are institutions that are competing for it than they were in 2012. Um, next slide, please. So question for all of you. Let's see where um, overall enrollments are going down past three years. What do you think is going on with the distance enrollments in particular be, now that we're going to have the most recent? So down. So please, all of you, click on one of your answers here, and we can take a look. Um, We have about 40% participation, so we'll keep going. Hopefully, we can get to 90 to 100%. Votes are coming in quickly. Come on, guys. Vote. And it's pretty close. These are so we, graded. We need some more participation. Okay, 70% keeps going up. Single click. Doesn't take too long. <laughs> Okay, another no, couple seconds. Oh, I think we could get to 90. We're close. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. Well, uh, clearly not a lot of people expect it to be dropping. Uh, there are some, though. I'm a bit surprised. Steady, a quarter of you, and then a, almost a third saying growing the same as previous years, and then about a third saying growing faster than previous years. So um, let's go to the next slide. And the answer is actually growing faster. Um, I'm not seeing the slide, however, is that, ah, okay, so I, uh, for the past year, so we now have, um, and looking uh, more distance education students for fall of 2015 than in any of the previous years, the, the growth between 2012 and 2013 was 3.4%. Uh, 2013 to 2014 was 3.3. And now we're back up 3.9% growth for this past reporting year from 2014 to 2015. Um, so those of you who voted went higher. Yeah, a bit higher than the previous, but you win. So that's 11% more students in 2015 studying in a distance than there were in 2012. Uh, and so see what that means in terms of the bigger picture. Let's take a look here. Um, next slide, please. That now it's over 6 million, and that's 30% of all students are na now taking a course at a distance. So, 14% of those students are taking only distance courses. 16% are taking a course with at least one distance course mixed with one or more on ground courses or on campus courses. And the remaining 70% have not are not taking any. We've seen that every year these numbers inch up slightly. Um, you know, to put this in perspective, the first year that the Batson Survey Research Group did the survey the, um, and published in 2004, that 6 million number was 1.6 million. So we are showing and has grown every year since. So there is no, even in the face of declining overall enrollments, 
distance continues to grow. Uh, next slide, and I'll we'll let some of my compatriots here talk a bit about what this means. Good. Well, let's see. Um, so one thing that really strikes me um, it, with this with this data, yeah, can you advance one slide? Um, is if you look at Everett Rogers' work uh, with the, the the diffusion of innovation, um, a lot of that's where we get a lot of the technology adoption curve, and it talks about different categories of adopters. Um, you know, the classic innovators, early adopters, the early majority, late majority, and laggards. Um, I think that that's important to look at this data because we've crossed a level with online education where it's not just a matter of going up in aggregate, you know, up to 30%. Part of the theory behind Everett Rogers and then extended by Jeffrey Moore was adding this chasm, and it's basically saying there's a very large difference in adopters between early adopters and early majority, and that tends to happen when you get 15 to 20 percent of a population trying out some new innovation or adopting. So if you look at the uh, data that Jeff is presenting, and we're talking about 30 percent of students taking at least some courses online, and also if you look at the back end of that, of how many schools and how many faculty members are teaching online courses, We've, we're now into a situation that the online education is no longer a niche. It's no longer just something sitting off in the corner with a particular group or maybe a continuing education department running it or just those individual faculty who are quite interested. We've now run into a situation where it's getting into the mainstream, and that's very significant in terms of what's going to happen next and causing changes to the whole system. Because the early adopters and the innovators, they tend to go with partial solutions. They tend to go with things that are, hey, I'll figure out how to piece things together and make things work. I'll try something and see how it works. When you move to the early majority, you get a lot more of a pragmatist mentality. You need, hey, I'll do this, but I need to have complete support. I don't need to have gaps in the system. This, you know, there's a different set of needs. And online education, based on these numbers and based on what we're seeing, it's, it's crossed this chasm. It's, it's gone beyond just early adopters. And that's got some fundamental implications to U.S. higher education. One is, and the reason we show this with straddling the chasm, is it causes support organization the uh, instructional designers, the administrators, the, uh, the various groups supporting this effort, they've got to serve two very different mindsets to help make online, online education work. And so I think that helps explain why you're getting a lot of stress in the system. It's difficult. A lot of people might be frustrated that we're, it might seem like we're relearning things we learned 10 years ago. But what's happening is you have a new set of people that are getting into this. The other thing, bringing it back to the institutional view, is I think this helps explain why you're getting a lot more um, traditional schools and new models who are trying to figure out what works. What is their role within online education and how do you actually support it? And one of the best case studies I know of, just to give an example, it's the University of Florida. They created the University of Florida online under a state uh, legislature initiative. And their initial view was, okay, we'll be able to grow, you know, very quickly with enrollment, a large percentage of out-of-state students. And there were certain assumptions that went into the model. And those assumptions might have been valid five or ten years ago, but they proved not to be fully successful right now. What the school has done over the past year, however, is they have looked at what's happening and they've changed their assumption set and replanned the program based on what's actually happening. 
And there are issues that will get into future reports, such as how many students who take online actually go to schools that are in their same state. Online education doesn't mean you just take it anywhere. There still is a regional bias. They reset their expectations on enrollments, et cetera. So I don't want to go through all the details, but the point is here's a school that's out there exploring how to fit this model into a traditional school, what the role is. There's a different set of expectations, and it's, it's an interesting world. So one of the things that's interesting to me with the data that's being presented is there's a lot of implications of this. It's not just, well, counting numbers, counting students. There's some really deep implications in how it affects higher education moving forward. And so that's one of the biggest things I see uh, based off of that. Jeff, before we get to the next section, I know there was a question. Can you clarify about the, uh, that this is, somebody was asking about, is this undergraduate or graduate or combined, the data that you've shown so far? Uh, yes, this is, these are combined graduate and undergraduate. It's overwhelming, just like all of higher ed is overwhelmingly undergraduate. Um, so the distance students are overwhelmingly undergraduate as well, but it's combined at all levels. So it, it's all students at any level at any of those degree-seeking, inst degree-granting institutions. And I would add, um, this is Terry, I would add kind of as a mom of a college student right now, um, the data kind of suggests that students are making um, choices, you know, very clear choices. I choose an online program, I choose an online course. And I will tell you as, you know, a current mom of a student who's making those choices, you know, they, he looks at online courses just like he does the others. Um, it's, he's not making a super conscious decision to, to consume the content this way. You know, it's the, be, the time that he could take English, whatever English class he needed to take at the time was online. And so that's what he did. And it wasn't, from my perception, it wasn't a big decision that he made to do it that way. So I think the other thing that we probably need to do for those who haven't followed this closely is define um, define the way iPEDS reports distance education. So the first um, the first choice is is the program or is the student studying exclusively online, and then the other is at least one course. And so um, we combine those to get some courses online, which is what Babs and Survey Research Group used for all those years, so that we've got comparable data, but what we're looking at here are students who've studied some course online, at least one, correct? Correct. This is, the number is students who took at least a single course online, um, and uh, the breakout, the 14% of those are taking, of all students, therefore, are taking only online courses, and 16% have a mix of uh, taking at least one at a distance and one at uh, non-distant um, and but that also uh, important to point out that this is there is a slight difference in the definition here from what we had done previously with the Baton Survey Research Group which was exclusively looking at online as opposed to distance and I see in one of the questions is how much of distant is on online and how much is other um, we don't have any really good measures of it there are some previous work that looked at this. We've done some surveys on, on this that show that virtually all of the distant is would have been classified as online, that there's, but it's not exclusive. There are some other things. However, the iPads definition specifically excludes correspondence courses, so they are not included in this. Okay, so let's jump back to Jeff. So let's take a look then at who's doing this and how they're doing this. So um, when we were first starting to do our studies back in the early 2000s, the growth in the number of students was coming from two factors. One was additional players entering the market. 
additional schools coming in and starting up programs. And then the second was the growth of programs that already existing. So the first growth, the people who were the pioneers in this area were the public institutions. On average, they started about two years ahead of all other types of institutions and grew faster and reached various plateaus about two years ahead of all those other institutions. And that was consistent. We could see that both in their growth. We could see that in the evolution of what issues they were gr grappling with. We could see that in what successes they had, that each year, if you looked at what the publics had done two years earlier, it was a pretty good indication of what you're going to see among the private not-for-profits and the for-profit institutions. Also early in that time period, the for-profits were a very, very small factor in this. It was only at, towards the end of that period that they began to really grow in those few large institutions. The, the University of Phoenix scale type of institutions really became important in that role. Um, so what we've now seen is that, and th this is actually the, the piece when we ask people to guess what proportion of all distance students are in for-profits? They are, oh, even higher ed people in higher education, they consistently guess higher than this, which is only 14% of all of distance students are in, are enrolled at uh, for-profit institutions, um, even though that is clearly where most of the attention in the public sector has been in terms of rules and regulations and um, lots of activity in terms of attention on that particular segment of the group. Um, next slide, please. So this is a, um, another poll for you, only three choices, pretty fast. Um, so public institutions have, are the largest factor, but who's growing fastest? Is it the publics that are still, because they're they still maintaining that two-year head start? Uh, the non-private non-profits, they were the ones who were lagging behind, or the for-profits, the people for whom the most attention has been paid. Okay, votes are rolling in. We're up to 50 percent. And I would just add, while we have this little lag, the fact that the publics are so dominant is a fact that Russ Poulin would like us all to remember. This is on his list of things that drive him crazy, is that there's this misperception and that, in fact, our public institutions led in this to begin with and continue to be very strong um, because they're supporting the students in their states. And so we just want to keep that one in mind. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, about even split, most people think the non the private nonprofits are the fastest growing pub with a slightly smaller group saying the publics and 11% uh, of you thinking it's the for profit. Well, this time you're, you're, you definitely are right. The private nonprofits have the fastest growth rates on all of this. We still have larger numbers of growth among the publics, but that's on a much bigger base. So as a percentage growth, the the people who have been playing catch up are the, the private not-for-profits. Um, and looking at these changes, so this is the number of either additional or fewer distance education students for each of the pre previous three-year periods to the end to see what that change has been. So between 2012 and 2013, to show this, 161,000 additional students at public institutions over in 2013 over 2012, 98,000 additional at the not-for-profits, and a loss of 73,000 in the private, uh, in, in the for-profits. Uh, again, you can see that every one of those three years, the for-profit sector has lost, and that we thought after seeing a 73,000 student loss from 12 to 13 and then only a 27,000 that they may have been stabilizing, but that has not been the case. They're down another 90,000 students in 2014 to 2015. But looking at that, that middle bar, 98,000 for the 
not-for-profits in for 2012 to 2013, 97,000, 2013 to 2014, and 109,000, 2014 to 2015. They have steadily been growing. At the beginning of that this time period in 2012, their total in distant enrollments were less than the for-profit sector, and they're now surpassed that. And in each of these years, they are the sector that has been growing the fastest. Um, they are catching up. They were late to the game, but they are catching up, and they're, if anything, accelerating their adoption and em embracing of distance ed. Um, okay, now next. Now this is a nice piece. So, over, overall enrollments are down. Distance enrollments are up. What's happening to the number of students on campus? Um, down a little, holding about the same down by several hundred thousand or down by more than several hundred thousand. So between 2012, when this data starts, and 2015, what happened to the number of students who are physically coming to campus? They may be taking all of their courses on campus, or they may be taking a mix of some courses and some distance courses, but it's the number of students physically showing up on a campus and what's going on here. People are considering their responses. This responses are coming in a little slower. Sixty-three percent. Give it just another couple seconds here. Okay, down by several hundred thousand is the primary, almost um, steady if by a quarter. 9% of you say down by more than several hundred thousand, and 7% thought a small increase. Um, the, actually, that bottom one, down by more than several hundred thousand, is the answer. It's down by almost a million. From 18 million, 18.294, to 17.363 in that time period, there is almost a million fewer students physically on campus in the fall of 2015 than there was in the fall of 2012. This has some fairly fundamental impact for the nature of higher education, both the number of students you need to serve, what services you need for them, how, how many classrooms you need, how many parking spaces you need, how many dorm rooms you need. All of these things are having a, an impact and potentially for the less financially well-off institutions, that impact can be quite serious. So this is an area we want to explore in far more depth is what is what's happening here. Um, and there's two possibilities for particular institutions. One is it's a carefully crafted approach. We're trying to move our students from on campus to distant. Or it could be it's happening to us, not because of us, and we're scrambling to catch up. And, and you know, my initial thoughts, particularly listening to how that's presented, is, uh, and I guess you could either take credit, <laughs> schools could take credit, or say that they're being reactive. At the same time, there's quite a change in student demographics. Um, you're, you know, the student population, it's not just the total numbers, but it's an increase in the number of what we used to call non-traditional students, working adults, people coming back to complete college, and, and those types of aspects. So I, it's probably difficult to say um, how much of this is, well, the student demographics are changing, therefore schools are reacting appropriately to that and maybe even in a proactive manner, or how much of it is, hey, these students demand it, it's going to happen whether or not schools participate. Somebody's got to provide it. And uh, I, it, do you see, it's a quick question for you, Jeff, and then I'll get to these other points. How, how big of a factor have you seen the change in student demographics between what used to be called traditional and non-traditional 
is impacting these changing dynamics that you're calling out? Uh, it's a absolutely a factor. The, the problem of all of these things is um, understanding correlation and causation. Um, there, they could be happening at the same time. We're seeing a change in the demographics. We have data on the demographics of the overall student body from iPads. We have data on the number of new or additional distance education student enrollments, but we don't have specific data, uh, national data, on the demographics of that call out how it's happening in distance ed versus on ground. So what we have is the data we can pull that's been reported by um, large systems who report this kind of data, the data we've seen in, in studies of individual institutions where there's strong indications that the demographics are changing, the non-traditional, um, it's always strange to have label something as traditional, um, especially in a field that's so young, but um, that the non-traditional student um, is a growing factor in all of this, but what we don't know is is that driving it or is that just happening to happen at the same time exactly and i expect that to be that's an important subject i think that schools are really going to have to wrestle with over the next several years if you can go back to that slide again um i had a couple other points one thing that strikes me is so we're seeing what and i'm overusing the word traditional but we're seeing the Southern New Hampshire universities, and they're and I'm calling them a non-traditional. They're a private, not-for-profit, but the way they're organized is not your typical academic model. It's very much based on targeting particular student groups, working adults, and and they organize themselves based on getting this online growth. Um, but you also have in the case I already mentioned, University of Florida where they're augmenting what they do in a traditional case with their online programs. And there are many others out there. What I expect that we should continue to see is all of these are involved. The for-profits, they're making major changes to their models as well. Um, so all the sectors are now fully involved with the impacts of online education. I would expect all of them not just to continue to be involved, but to evolve and expand their offerings. And the evolution means we're getting into new situations here. This is not just a continuation of the past. So I would expect that we'll see new models. Some of it gets into competency-based education, although that hasn't been in large numbers yet outside of uh, two or three schools. But there are new models that are evolving. And then also the point about expanding online offerings, we're seeing a lot more schools getting involved. So there are new online programs. It's not just does this university have some online program. It's also, it's two other things. Do you have multiple programs that are offered fully at a distance? And the second case that should not be overlooked, are there more and more online courses offered for students who are there with a traditional face-to-face -face program so that the students are on campus but they also take online courses so they're doing a mix. That expansion into multiple areas is something that I think we're going to continue to see. Put another way, it's a big mistake to look at online education as a monolithic single entity. You know, too often the caricature in the national media is it's for-profit schools, fully online students. And that just doesn't capture the rich and richness of what's happening. And as Jeff has shown in the data, it's happening across multiple sectors. Um, it's a mix of fully online, some courses online, and there's a variety of approaches. One of the implications of this is this is changing the overall competition for students. It's no, as I mentioned before, it's no longer a matter of, hey, throw out an online program, and of course you're gonna get students naturally coming there. You, you have other schools who are gonna be offering online programs and students can choose from there. So there's a new level of competition that's out in the market, if you will. And in the best case, it's driving schools to, have a deeper consideration about 
wait, who are our target students? Who can we serve? Are they regional? What's the nature of what they need? Are they non-traditional working adult? Are they traditional age students? And figuring out much more specifically, who are the students we're trying to serve and what do they need? That's on the good side. On the bad side, I think we're going to see um, you know, several programs that come and go. Um, Cal State Online is an example of a program that came out, had certain assumptions, and it hasn't quote unquote gone away, but it's completely morphed into something different. I think we'll see more of that where there are online programs, the ones that don't truly understand their student needs and adjust accordingly, that will go. So there's going to be some chaos out there. The second point is, uh, I think that we're getting into a level where it's, there's a demand for a new set of pedagogical and student support models. So it's not just duplicating what we've done over the past 15 years. Part of this evolution driven by focusing on what do students need is going to get into, hey, we need to rethink how do we get to the next level of course design that really engages students. How do we provide them the scaffolding to be successful? I saw several questions in the, in the questions box about attrition and retention. That's a huge issue. You need to really engage and really support students to increase your retention rates. And so that's going to demand better designs and better support models. So I think the numbers are going to push that direction. And those are not the only outcomes, graduation rates and other student outcome measures. There's a new set of uh, demands or accountability, some of them useful, but some of them counterproductive, but they're out there that are really driving what's happening in the overall landscape for online education. So again, to me, that's fascinating data, but if you really think about the implications, it should help us understand the stresses we're seeing out there and what should happen next. And it's really important to base a lot of our assumptions and planning based on reality and be careful not to base it off of misconceptions uh, of what online education is. Terry, other thoughts from you? Yeah, I just, well, there's a question that just came in on the chat that I wanted to toss out to you guys. So the question, um, is are we seeing any trends around offering sort of micro-credentialing? So breaking up that Carnegie unit into smaller learning outcomes that lead to, you know, unbundling credit hours, if you will, badging and those kinds of things. Um, obviously, we're not seeing that in this particular data because they don't count that. But in, in your research and um, conversations, are you seeing any models that are successful in doing that unbundling? Uh, this is Jeff, and I'd say what we're seeing so far is an awful lot of interest in it, not necessarily um, institutions picking it as a strategic direction as much as wondering if it is a possible direction or something they should. So there's a lot of interest. There's a lot of exploring. Where should we take this? There's um, a lot of experimentation often in individual programs, um, not at an institutional level, but at a much lower level, um, where often it's being done to say, does it have a, does it have a role for us? So um, I think it's um, what we're seeing is just the beginning of opening this kind of exploration. We don't know where it's really going to take us. Um, and as you just said, the, the current data we have tracking this actually doesn't me measure it at all. So we really need a new mechanism to get at what if this is actually going to happen, whether it's whether it's micro-credentials and badging or if it's any um, the change of the traditional course, the competency-based pieces. Most of our traditional measures don't do a good job of measuring change. And we're going to have to come up with better measures if we if the change is fundamental in the delivery mechanisms. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting. It's, uh, just a quick comment. It's interesting if you talk to, uh, you go to other countries and you go to Europe, several countries I've talked to there or in meetings there, and to a certain degree, the iPads database 
is sort of the envy. A lot of places are saying, boy, we wish we had that comprehensive and consistent of data. It has issues, but boy, we wish we had it. But there are limitations, and Jeff points out a great one. It really doesn't capture some of these leading issues, such as you know, micro-credentials at all. But it's very fortunate we have what we have. Um, and, but other than that, I certainly am seeing the same thing that Jeff is saying, that there's a lot of interest in the exploration around the edges, but I've seen no aggregate data, or I don't think we're to the level that we can say how much of the change is going to happen or to measure it properly. What we get are anecdotes, um, things such as I, I know a, a an outsourcing agency that provides computer programmers under contract. And for Python programmers, one thing they told me is less than 50% now have an undergraduate degree. They've essentially get their qualifications through micro-credentials. But that's an anecdote from one company. And I think we're in an area where we're seeing interest, but most of the data that I've seen is very anecdotal and very specific so far. Thank you. Yeah, there's another comment here that's asking about institutions who are looking at this from the employer's perspective, which, which is really what you're hitting on there, Phil. You know, is there, is there a way to, um, you know, what, what are the implications when you have to, you know, ASU is now working with all these people who work at Starbucks. What does that mean about when they need to schedule support for their online classes? You know, there's, there's some on the ground implications when you really try to meet those student needs and sometimes you don't anticipate them as well as you'd like to. You know, I mean, I when we started CU Online all those years ago, it never even occurred to me that most of our students, you know, would be studying at 2 to 5 o'clock in the morning, but that's when they were doing it. So, um, you know, you just, you have to be um, ready to respond and, um, and listen to the students um, and then make the program fit them rather than the other way around. And I think in general, sometimes our institutions are a little slow at that kind of adaptive um, response. Sure. And I think there's no doubt that a lot of the biggest changes and experiments going on right now are in that junction between traditional post-secondary education and workforce development. It's sort of the line of where college ends and job training begins and how they relate to each other. That's where, that is the area where you see so much of the different programs being tried out for micro-credentials or, or, or partnerships where the employers are much more involved in sending employees to particular programs. You mentioned the Starbucks ASU or whatever. So that area is definitely a very interesting area where a lot of things are being tried out. Um, and it'll be interesting to watch. I should point out, um, if you go back to, look what's happened to the large scale um, MOOCs, the Coursera, the Udacities, the edXs. When they first came out, well, first of all, we had the challenge where people equated online education with MOOCs in the national media, which is unfortunate, but I think we're mostly past that. But the other thing that happened is they started out with the model, we're going to change college education and much more people getting degrees, and that was a lot of their focus. Well, if you look at them today, most of them have really morphed into serving this, this after college or transition from college and job skills and job training area. So they have moved there is one example of where online education has changed. Great. So somebody put the question out there that nobody wants to answer. Um, what are your suggestions for updating the term? What's the updated term that replaces distance education? How do we, how do we find the right words to really paint the picture of all that this encompasses um, without confusing people? Anybody have thoughts on that? How about education? Um. <laughs> <laughs> yep or learning or something. Um, the, the big piece here that in most institutions, um, so we have two, two 
trends going on here. One is, you know, are we moving away from a traditional class or piece in micro credentials and different types of teaching and pieces like that? And how does that manifest itself for at a distance? And the second is just seeing, you know, we're now at 30% of all students taking, engaging in some form of distance education as part of their normal educational environment. You know, at some point you have to stop calling it labeling it as different when it becomes that big a part of your institution. Most institutions now do no, no longer or never did differentiate between whether you took the course at a distance or took it on campus, that when you're putting together your program or looking or getting your degree, there's not an indication of the mode in which you did this. It's just the course. So there's the, the distance piece um, is far more interesting and far much more used as a label by those of us studying it and those of us running these kind of programs than it is by the students taking it. Um, and I, you know, one of the other questions here was uh, was a question about how do inst should institutions change what they do and do better scheduling so so that on campus students don't need to take distance courses to meet their timing issues and the, the for example the ex, what Terry was suggesting as an example um, and what we're seeing is exactly the opposite is that in most cases where they're looking at this they're just treating it as a different course and saying oh we don't need to make all of these changes because students can just take this distance one which is time and location independent and therefore we don't have to worry about this constraint anymore and the students learn just as well or they think they do um, obviously a, something that needs to be continuously tested and it works for the student and it works for us yeah i'd like to add on to that because that was an interesting question uh, posed by andy that and that jeff is addressing uh, i definitely see online education particularly in the taking at least one online class and not all fully online is a directly being used by schools to deal with the scheduling challenges. I do, uh, to mention a uh, past consulting client, I hope you don't mind, um, I've seen some movement where people are trying to change what they're doing. Uh, Iowa State University, one of the things that was interesting in working with them is they really view their role as once you get into the school, you will get the classes you need to graduate on time and they strategically push everybody to go that direction. They do not have a large online initiative um, so far. So one of the things they're working on is they're really trying to invest in smart classrooms, reconfigurable classrooms. They're trying to make the switch over between classes a lot more efficient um, so that they can get be more efficient in their use of space online. So I would have to look at them. They're, they're making marginal improvements around their scheduling. They're putting in money to try to make it a much more effective for when you do use the classroom. But you could probably argue they're the exception rather than the rule that Jeff had mentioned, that a lot of schools are saying, well, because we have online education, that addresses the anywhere, anytime, therefore it puts less stress on us changing our traditional practices. Interesting question, but I think I'm seeing the same thing. And then I would add, um, you really need to think about the costs associated with this because, um, you know, other work that Russ and I did earlier this year, a survey that actually went out last year, shows that by and large, we are still charging students more tuition or total costs, in some case, the tuition is the same, but we're still charging um, distance learning fees that make the total cost of students for those distance courses higher. So if if it's really not a choice, then it, they shouldn't have differential tuition, my personal opinion. Um, but you know, we we're everybody's operating in financial structures that are their reality, and they you know it costs them more money to deliver the courses in some cases too. So it just it feels like the technology is becoming ubiquitous, but we haven't figured out how to just make it part of the way we do business in some cases. And so we're calling it out as different when it's more the same than not. 
Yeah. And, and there was another question I saw that sort of gets into it about the, that got into sort of the blending. I, I will say that as there is more engagement with online education, individual courses or programs, and the necessary understanding of different student needs, different pedagogical styles enabled or required because of it. I'm seeing a lot of bleed through where a lot of schools are now saying, wow, because of this online course, we're actually learning things that we can apply over here to our face-to-face -face courses. And as that process moves through, which I hope and accelerates, it, the lines, the the boundaries between what's face-to-face -face and what's online is going to continue to get blurrier um, in a good way because I think the different styles will feed off of each other. Uh, there's another question here about the continuation of some of the other measures that we had done in our previous Babson studies. In particular, these were when we had gone out to um, chief academic officers, provosts, academic VPs, and probing them for their attitudes, strategies, um, things like that. Um, that Those are the measures of did institutions consider online learning to be strategic? What, what was their view about the relative outcomes? Things like that. Um, the answer to that, is, uh, to the question of are we going to continue to do that is sort of. And with the answer is yes, but with a really big asterisk. So the the issue is that um, by the time we reach the end of our 14, 15 years of collecting this data and the iPads data was out, many of those indicators were barely moving from year to year. So it did not make a lot of sense to go out and measure them every year. So we will go back and measure these things, but maybe not every year. The second piece is we're we want to make room and go out and measure new things as well. So what we will be doing is, as we evolve on our future reports doing these as part of this partnership is we will be doing additional data collection, um, but it will be driven by particular questions and, and aspects that we want to examine. So these questions that were listed in some of our previous things will be revisited over time and will be reported, but in the context of maybe not as frequently and in the context of additional aspects that we might want to consider and look at. And for that, we always want to know what would you most want to know from these people. And again, this is the beauty of the partnership because we can all work collaboratively and potentially cover more of the questions that people are asking if we're not all working on the same basic data. So it's a good thing. I think with that, we probably need to turn it back to you, Megan, don't we, for a, a wrap up? Because if my clock is right, we're about at the two minute warning already. Yes, so thanks everybody for a wonderful presentation today. And do be on the lookout. The report should be available the first week of May, so we'll be sending you a link to that. And if you have any questions in the meantime, our presenters have provided their contact information there. Do visit the WCET website to learn more about the benefits of being a member. And again, the link to the recording and any additional resources will be sent to you via email. You'll also get an email from GoToWebinar with a link to the recording, and that usually comes out a little sooner than we update our website, so we'll be looking for that within the next day. The final report will be available at digitallearningcompass.org when that's available. And mark your calendars. Our Leadership Summit, Essential Institutional Capacities to Lead Innovation, is coming up June 14th through the 15th in Salt Lake City. The WCET annual meeting, which is open to members and non-members, is October 25th through the 27th, and the call for proposals is open now through the first uh, Friday in May, so be sure to submit your ideas. Thank you to WCET supporting members and WCET annual sponsors. And again, thank you to the wonderful presenters today and for your participation and excellent questions. We'll see you on the next webcast, which is tomorrow and you still have time to register, so be sure to do that. Thanks again all.